when they're ready. All right, thank you so much, sorry for the delay. And um, my name is Farshad, and today I'm gonna talk about uh, some of our theoretical works on matching habitat choice and its effects on the uh, evolution of a species range. And before I start, I should apologize that I have made many slides, but I'm not really gonna go over all those details and I'm gonna skip some of the slides because this is gonna be a short, it is supposed to be a short uh, talk and relatively relaxed. But I keep those details in my slides, fortunately, hopefully to get more questions after the talk. So uh, matching habitat choice, this is the formal definition, uh, which in short, it means that uh, this is an adaptive dispersal strategy in which uh, species individuals uh, try to assess the environment and then move to the location which best matches their phenotype. This phenotype uh, matching can give them uh, better performance. And if the phenotype is fitness related, then that can give also the individuals better fitness and then that can result in adaptation. So if I want to show you this uh, simple process in this cartoon, you can consider a habitat composed of sub several patches shown in dashed lines. And imagine the environment is imposing an optimal value for a trait, which can be like something like body size or build depth or whatever. And imagine that optimal value is shown by this color gradient. Then the population of the species is initially distributed on these patches and the color of each individual indicates the, the phenotype value of that individual. Okay. Then if we assume that perfect matching habitat choice occurs, then those individuals can evaluate their uh, environment and then they can move freely to those locations that matches their phenotype. This is the way they get perfect uh, matching habitat, right? So there have been some like experimental and empir empirical studies on uh, detecting and testing for matching habitat choice in nature. And this has been one of the interesting ones on, the, on a camouflage-based background matching for grasshoppers. Uh, they have tested uh, a camouflage of grasshoppers over this dark pavement and pale pavement. And these grasshoppers have a gradient in their color from pale gray to dark gray. And then you can see the degree of uh, crypses on the, on the dark uh, pavement and the pale pavement. So you see that the, for example, pale grasshopper gets a high degree of crypses in the uh, pavement. And this is the natural behavior that they have seen in the, uh, in the, in the grasshoppers when they do, they do their study. And then they have done some color manipulation to test for uh, matching habitat choice. Then uh, they, they change the color of the, uh, they manipulate the color of these grasshoppers. And then they test that if they are going to choose uh, the dark uh, or pale pavement based on their manipulated color or not. So the result is this. On the left, you see the natural behavior of unmanipulated grasshoppers. So the pale ones are gonna mostly choose uh, the, 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 on the vertical axis, you see the probability of using dark uh, asphalt. So the pale uh, grasshoppers uh, most likely don't choose dark asphalt, but the uh, dark ones are gonna most likely you will choose the dark as well. This is the natural behavior of unmanipulated ones. And then the manipulated ones, the, the dark colored ones and the white colored ones show the same behavior. And this is the way they uh, conclude for, uh, for matching habitat choice behavior in these grasshoppers. There has been another study of, of, of a unicellular uh, ciliate in a microcosm. So let me just skip that. And 
looking at this uh, cartoon, you will see that if we consider geno genetic factors, then matching habitat choice is not so simple, uh, as simple as it looks like. For example, if individuals are highly mobile and then they have sort of facilities that can as, uh, assess the environment very quickly, then matching habitat choice can facilitate rapid adaptation even in a single generation. And it significantly reduces within population genetic variation. For example, in this cartoon, you see that initially the, the amount of variation in this local population is high, but after the matching habitat choice in each local population, in each patch, the genetic variation is so low. And it increases between population genetic divergence because they are, there is a sort of like spatial assortment resulting from matching habitat choice. And, uh, in decreases local uh, diver, uh, local variation, but it increases between 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 population divergence, and this uh, uh, facilitated adaptation and uh, reduced variation can indirectly promote assortative mating, and then that assortative mating can. Uh, in turn promote re reproductive isolation and phenotypic secretion that by itself can promote sympathetic speciation which can result in an increase in biodiversity so we see that considering genetic factors this matching habitat source choice can actually have significant con consequences and also that rapid adaptation can uh, be hypothesis that it increases range expansion speed and it enhances population persistence. But most of these results that I, and uh, effects that I'm listing here have been verbally discussed and argued. So there have been uh, very few uh, like quantitative and model-based studies that they have been trying to uh, verify these uh, effects, but most of the results so far are just like uh, verbal. So, oh, sorry. And there have been some um, important questions uh, in, in, in the studies of matching habitat choice. Uh, these are some of the important ones. Uh, despite those effects, Evidence for matching habitat choice in nature is still very limited. And in order to find the reason, we may need to understand under what conditions matching habitat choice is sufficiently beneficial to evolve. And there, there are some other ecological factors that counterbalance the effect of matching habitat choice, like, like competition can counterbalance the effect of matching habitat choice. And then that uh, tells us that just verbal and intuitive discussion about the effect of matching habitat so choice on, uh, on, uh, on range dynamics of a species can be a bit misleading. So we need to uh, quantitatively understand how matching habitat choice influences range dynamics, especially when the environment is temporarily varying. And detection of matching habitat choice in nature is not straightforward at all because many of those adaptive effects of matching habitat choice can be attributed to a strong natural selection or phenotypic plasticity. So we need to find some features of matching habitat choice that uh, specifically distinguish this mode of adaptation from the other ones. Our uh, work has been a sort of attempt to uh, quantitatively verify some of those effects and understand the effects of matching habitat choice, especially on the uh, range dynamics of the species. For that, we have developed a deterministic PDE model. This PDE model considers an environmental gradient, which can be a gradient on the body size, for example, or the color of grasshoppers. It assumes individuals disperse both randomly and also using phenotype optimal, which is a sort of matching habitat choice that I will uh, explain soon. The random component can be considered as a sort of exploratory behavior that the individuals are gonna do to evaluate their environment. 
and then then they find the best the best matching location and then they move to for toward that location and the individuals are subject to selective force of natural selections and also intraspecific competitions our model con considers joint evolution of three quantities N is the population density of that species, Q is the mean value of that phenotypic trait, and V is the variance of that phenotypic trait. So our model develops, actually provides the equations for evolution of N, Q, and V in a one or two or three dimensional space. So the model basically is, uh, derived from these basic equations that gives the evolution of uh, the density of phenotypes. Since N is the density of the population, if as we assume that phi gives the, uh, phi gives the density of the phenotype P, then N times phi gives the density of total, phi, if, if phi is the distribution of phenotype P, then N phi is the, distribution is the density of phenotype P. Then the change in the density of phenotype P over a short time interval tau, we assume that it comes from four different uh, processes. One of them is the diffusive or random movements of these individuals. The other one is the phenotype optimal or matching habitat choice. Then there is also an intrinsic growth rate of that, that phenotype. And we also assume that the uh, phenotypes can change due to mutation. So these are the four components that are uh, included in our model. I'm not gonna go to into any of those details. I mainly focus on the phenotype optimal component, but just if, you, if I want to say some uh, comments quickly, the intrinsic growth rate is just a, a standard logistic growth comes from the, this Lutka-Volterra equation. This, is, this term captures the effect of natural selection. This Q, capital Q, is the optimal value for the trait that environment is imposing. It's that color gradient that I showed in my cartoon. And then competition is, uh, the, is modeled by this kernel, which is based on an overlap between the resource or phenotype utilization of the uh, individuals. If I want to make some more comments about this phenotype utilization, you can assume there is a resource utilization curve. If we have a resource access, like for example, the seed size of uh, for, for a bear, and then we assume a, a bear uses, a, a, the, exp, utilizes those seeds, uh, based on a Gaussian curve, means that the peak of that Gaussian curve is the best size of the seeds that the bird is gonna use. So we can assume that this uh, phenotype utilization somehow tells us that phenotype P uh, up to what level is gonna utilize another resource or, or another value of a phenotype. So, uh, and then we have mutational changes which is not uh, important for uh, for the purpose of my talk. The optimal dispersal is the main uh, objective that we have modeled it as an advection equation. The velocity of that advection is coming from this parameter A times this negative gradient of theta. Uh, it uh, looks like it's analogous to uh, the diff diffusion equations that we have in uh, we have in uh, physics, uh, V A is in physics for the for the like ion transfers in a liquid. A is usually the mobility of the ions. Here we assume A is the propensity of the individuals to disperse optimally, and then this negative gradient of theta is like a perceived force for uh, dispersing optimally. And this theta can be considered as a dispersal potential energy for uh, phenotype P to, to disperse optimally. The reason that I'm using the terms force and potential energy is just I wanted to make an analogy to drift diffusion equations in physics. So what, that, that, what does that mean? Means that if we assume 
the, the potential energy for dispersal is given by this, which is just a first order approximation of the phenotype utilization. Then if phenotype P is, is far away from the optimal phenotype, then there is a huge potential energy to disperse optimally so that the phenotype P finds a better matching location so that the difference of the P and Q becomes smaller, and then that way the, the individual uh, finds a better matching location. Then the force that is created by this energy is coming from the uh, gradient of that, and when we get, take the gradient of this potential energy, we see that not only the difference of the phenotype and the optimal phenotype matters, also the gradient of the inter in, in, of the uh, environment also matters, which makes sense because if they, there is no gradient in the environment, then there is no point to make optimal dispersal because we, the individual is not going to get any benefit. But if there is a huge gradient in the environment, then it, there should be a strong dis, uh, is dispersal, uh, optimal dispersal, because that indicates that the individual can get a lot of benefit by moving. Okay, if we plug in these uh, components that I showed here in the in this basic equation, we find the first, second, and uh, uh, first and second moments. We find that the equations for the evolution of density, mean value of the trade, and the variance of the trade. And the terms that I have highlighted in orange are the effects of the matching habitat choice. You see that these effects actually show up in different ways, which I'm not gonna go into the details, but it tells you that uh, the effects are not so simple and it, they, they can appear in different ways in the core of the population and in the uh, marginal and the periphery of the population. And then we have done some like work to adjust the uh, units for the parameters of the model and also the range of the values to be biologically realistic. And then we found some results. First, let me show you the results on the range dynamics. When we have no optimal dispersal, means that just random dispersal versus the case that we have a strong optimal dispersal. On the left, I show population density. On the middle, I'm showing the trait mean and on the right, trait variance. So, and then these different curves show the propagation of the species over the space in time. So each curve has been, is, shown, is shown at a different instance of time and the arrows are showing the evolution in time. So initially the population is started from this, uh, orange curve, thick orange curve, and then it, it establishes itself to a high density and then propagates uh, and then spreads in a traveling wave form. And the trait mean shows adaptation to the environment gradient. The environment gradient that I'm showing here, the trait optimum is in this black line. We assume that it changes linearly Initially, the the trade values are are below that. We, I mean, the trade values initially are these orange curves, which are which we don't have perfect adaptation. But uh, over the time, as the uh, as the population gets adapted and expands its range, these trade values get closer and closer to the uh, optimum. It means that uh, we get better and better adaptation. And this is the care of tra trade variance. These dashed lines are showing the range, range of the uh, species over this uh, sample curve that I have highlighted in red, and trade variance is like this. Outside the dashed lines, the values of trade variance are meaningless because the population is almost zero there. So only inside the dashed lines, we can consider the trade variance to be meaningful. So it has a peak at the center of the population. So this is the range dynamics, typical range dynamics, when there is no optimal dispersal. And we see that adaptation to the optimal dispersal in this inset occurs relatively slowly. After about like 10 generations, we see almost a good adaptation to the optimal. 
value. But when there is a strong dispersal, means that when I make that parameter A to be a large value 10, then adaptation can occur by this optimal dispersal very quickly by, by many matching habitat choice, almost in one generation, from the initial value of the trait to the uh, to the almost close value to uh, optimum is almost one generation. So that tells us that a uh, strong matching habitat choice is actually increasing the uh, ability of these species to adapt. And also we, if we compare these two graphs, we see that the range expansion speed is also uh, increased significantly by the by the effect of matching habitat choice. If I want to quantify this for different values of gradient, these results are shown for the steep gradient uh, environment. If I want to see what happens for different values of gradient, here I am just calculating the wave amplitude and wave speed when those propagating waves. I show them for different values of the gradient. You will see that when gradient is too large, then without, without optimal dispersal, the population goes extinct quickly, but with optimal dispersal, population goes uh, extinct for, uh, for, for much larger values of gradient. Means that lower values of gradient can result in uh, extinction of the population when the uh, there is no optimal dispersal, but when there is optimal dispersal, we get that extinction in much higher values. Wave speed increases with optimal dispersal, especially when the gradient is too large. And trait variance decreases as they are with optimal dispersal, and when the gradient is large, the amount that we see in that decrease and that reduction in the trait variance becomes more significant. So. These graphs actually tells us that when the environment is too extremely steep, then the effects of matching habitat choice are stronger. But the interesting point is that based on our estimation, the plausible values for the gradient can only be those very small values that I have highlighted here in this instance. Means some values between zero and two. And zero, between zero and two, if you see these inset, insets, you will see that the effects of matching habitat choice are not so significant if the environment is relatively shallow. Only when it is very steep means that near value two, then the effects become significant. Values greater than two we consider as implausible. Okay, so this is one of our findings that actually steep environmental gradient is, is important as is necessary for the effects of matching habitat choice to be uh, important. So I, I think I need to go quickly. So in this, uh, uh, here I'm just showing the effects of matching habitat choice on the gene flow. Uh, in this graph, I saw, I show the uh, rate of change in Q means that I'm showing the derivative of Q means that the derivative of changes in the mean values of the Q as the species population is expanding its range. Dashed line is the margin uh, margin of the range. And the for this graph, I'm showing that only the effects of random movement. Here, I'm showing that only the effects of the optimal dispersal, and here I'm showing the effect of both random and optimal. And I'm showing this for the half of the population at which positive values means adaptive effects, negative values means maladaptive effects. So these graphs essentially show that gene flow, when it is random, is always maladaptive. When we have only optimal dispersal, it is always adaptive to the range margins. And the combination of these two is also adaptive to the range margin. It means that matching habitat choice can effectively compensate for maladaptive, maladaptive effects of gene flow and makes it always adaptive to the 
uh, range margins, which facilitates uh, range expansion. And these effects are observed for different levels of the uh, strengths of ma matching habitat choice and also at different gradients. And if the environment is fluctuating, when I'm shifting up and down the trade optimum, then the, uh, then the population density is gonna shift up and down because it cannot immediately adapt to the uh, new climate, new environment, the density goes down. And then at the steady state, it, the density will fluctuate between two values when we have no optimal dispersal. When we have optimal dispersal, this optimal dispersal is going to facilitate fast adaptation, and then the population can get rapidly adapted to the fluctuating environment. As a result, the population density that we see here is much larger than the case that we have no dispersal. Range expansion speed under this fluctuating environment is also much higher. And if I calculate the, mac the average between this maximum and minimum, uh, steady state fluctuations and show them based on different values of the amplitude of fluctuations, strengths of natural selections or maximum growth, we will see that without uh, optimal dispersal, the chance of uh, survivor is lower. But with maximum, with, uh, with matching habitat choice, the chance of survival in fluctuating environments becomes higher. So, from these graphs, we can consider that matching habitat choice has important effects on the persistence of the individual in, uh, persistence of the population, especially if the population it has is slowly growing. If it is slowly growing, we see that without habitat choice, the population becomes extinct, but with habitat choice, the population has reasonably good density. So, we did the simulation also, also in the two-dimensional fragmented habitat. I'm not gonna go to the details, but we essentially observe same effects. And if I want to conclude, our results quantitatively support some of the uh, properties of matching habitat choice, which facilitates rapid adaptation, reduces phenotypic variance, creates adaptive gene flow, increases range expansion speeds, and enhances persistence in rapidly fluctuating environments. If you remember, there were some important questions. One of them was that the, the matching habitat choice is not very frequently observed in nature. Uh, from our results, we could suggest a reason for that. And that reason is that it, matching habitat choice is sufficiently consequential if the environmental gradient is very steep. That means that is likely steeper than the, major, than the gradient that the majority of species uh, usually uh, experience in nature. And we identified two, uh, two properties which can be considered uh, as uh, hallmarks of my phenotype optimal dispersal or matching habitat choice. One of them is that gene flow is always adaptive, especially, especially at range margins. When, we, when the population can, can disperse optimally. And the trait variation at the center of the population is significantly reduced when the population uh, uses adaptive, this, like matching habitat choice strategies. These two important features can be considered as hallmarks of uh, matching habitat choice, and then they can help planning studies for detecting habitat choice in nature or in laboratory. And uh, we could suggest that based on our results, matching habitat choice is mostly beneficial for slowly growing species when, that are exposed to frequent changes in their environment. So uh, further studies on to test matching habitat choice can probably focus on this sort of slowly growing species. The examples of that can be, for example, uh, nomadic birds, elephants, and and species like these that can disperse very uh, to very long distance and also uh, have good cognitive uh, capabilities to to assess their environment. And uh, the references that we use that the the results that we have obtained are now available in these two papers. One of them is in. Uh, 
is in bioarchive now, the other one is already published. And some of the results that I, general results that are talked about to introduce matching habitat choice can be found in these papers. Sorry that my talk became too long, actually. Thank you for your attention.